Australia, of course, is a country that loves the idea of migration. Um, we're going to see some talented new Australians grow. And of course, uh, when it comes to increasing your population, it's really three factors, births, deaths, and migration. And of course, today, Australia is around 26 and a half million. We're well on our way to 30 million. And uh, we'll be closer to 40 million people by mid-century. So we have a massive population coming into the country and of course our own births and deaths and population brings a demographic conversation. Welcome to the Urban Property Investor. I'm your host, Sam Saggers, here to help you crack the code of real estate wealth. Today's show, a demographic extravaganza. Yes, we're going to dig into one of the momentum drivers of real estate, the idea that people matter and demographics plays a huge part in property success. We're going to dig into personas inside of the real estate economy, the Paddington effect. We're going to discover some cohorts you need to know about, learn about suburb cycles, touch on the Forex growth plan and have a generational conversation. Does that sound enticing? I hope so. And of course, welcome back my regular listeners. Thank you so much for tuning in. And of course, Thank you for those that have left a review. Now, I'm going to do a bit of a uh, shout out, in fact, to a couple of people who've reviewed. And I appreciate your uh, review. It has it has lit up my world. So firstly, Brave55555. Five, 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 five. Brave Five Fives has left a message and uh, wow, thank you very much uh, for your brutal commentary on property wealth. Thank you, Brave Five Five Five. Much appreciated. And I've got another one from T from Sydney, not just, uh, uh, it's actually T-E-E-E-E-E. So there's five E's in the T, T from Sydney, just uh, one word, legend. So I was saying this the other day, I don't think females use the word legend. So I'm pretty sure T555 is a fella. So thank you, uh, Brave555 and T555. Thank you so much. And of course, David has left a message. David Gerard, thank you for your message as well. And M Rose, uh, you get the shout out. You listen every week. Love the podcast. It's different. Yes, we're different here. We uh, we pick on Gopniks. We talk about not ending up at Lake Weirdo and we talk real estate. So uh, thank you for coming to this different podcast. We try to be different here. Do it different. We don't want to be accused of being boring, do we? Uh, so let's do today's uh Today's program, we're going to, uh, are you ready to go on a demographic odyssey? Well, I hope so. Today is all about the momentum driver of demographics, which is a a big part of my 4X growth plan. And of course, you guys know the 4X growth plan. It's a big, big part of property success. And uh, really, when I delve into market drivers, there's six of them in real estate. There is, of course, long-term factors such as population growth, the economy, and infrastructure growth, often as we refer to as pi. And then uh, we have more short-term factors which are going to drive growth over a certain period of time, which include demographic factors. Demographic factors play a part, along with, obviously, supply versus demand. And the performance of a 
rental return or yield performance. So recently we caught up with uh, Jeff Braley, old Jeff from McCrindle, and of course he uh, left us some information to work with when it comes to demographics. And uh, I think it's just fascinating. I've been a big believer in the study of what people do and how they react to real estate markets and, of course, how they adore suburbs and have long since linked that to successful outcomes in real estate. Now, today in Australia, there are six generations. The first generation is the builder. The builder built this whole concept. They built the economy. uh, They built the stock market. They built the housing market. Um, They built the framework of what a modern society is, and they built it um, through some pretty hard times. If you can imagine, they were born basically just before the Great Depression and uh, uh, all the way through to to World War II. And uh, they were really born uh, during that period of just total world chaos. And today they are our much older part of our community. They're in their 80s. And, um, you know, most of the people you meet in their 80s are wise old foxes. They've usually got um, some pretty interesting information to relate. And of course, the builders had the boomers and the boomers today are anywhere from sort of 60 to sort of uh, 75 odd years of age. And the boomer generation, as we know, is one of the luckiest generations to have lived. They all bought real estate for a can of Coke and today that real estate is worth a bucket load of money. They're very frugal. They uh, tend to hang out in coffee shops and have $3 muffins and $2 coffees. Uh, But let's talk about these frugal people that live in $5 million houses and drink uh, basically frugal coffee. Then we have Generation X, which I'm a Generation X. Today, Generation X are at their peak level of income Uh, They are really the people in charge of companies today. They are the politicians in charge of states, territories, even uh, the Australian government. Generation X today are the CEOs of of big companies. And really, when you understand that generation, they are in their 40s to mid 50s and were born anywhere between 1965 and 1979. And uh, if you want to know my uh, birth year, I'm a 1975 person. And of course, uh, then we have the Gen Ys, sometimes known as the Millennials. They're uh, basically anywhere between sort of 30 to, to sort of 44 And generationally, the millennials today are going through a cycle of starting families. So we've seen a huge demographic influence from from them, certainly uh, looking for different types of property accommodation, going into their family formation stage. The fifth generation is Gen Z. These are people you're probably discovering in your workplace that are quite strange, little uh, young critters, and uh, they they are really entering the workforce. And then after that, we have Gen Alpha. Gen Alpha are basically sort of under the age of 13, and uh, they are suggested to be a massive, massive generation coming through the system. When we look at the boomers, really, uh, according to McCrindle, uh, the most uh, top fear for a baby boomer today is they won't have enough money to live comfortably in retirement. It's around 55% of baby boomers that uh, fundamentally don't have enough money. And uh, despite me saying many bought real estate for a can of Coke and a frugal muffin eaters, Many aren't. In fact, more are headed to the pension line. And of course, 
Um, many boomers as well today, uh, one of their biggest fear is now suffering a long-term illness. Over 54% of boomers worry about that. So you can see uh, today, People in their late 50s, early 60s, into their 70s, this is their concern. And uh, we can learn from from peering over into the generation ahead of us and go, okay, well, if 54% of them don't feel safe, uh, perhaps in our generation, we need to do something about that. We can learn really what is influencing and important to that generation. And of course, when I look at my own generation, according to McCrindle, uh, 67% of my generation, Generation X, people born between 1965 and 1979, 67% are concerned that they will not have enough money to live comfortably. And, uh, Wow, that's that's a big jump from the generation before them. And so you can see it's starting to even get worse, this conversation about having enough money to keep up with the world we live in. More the, All the more reason to take care of your own wealth, by the way. And, uh, of course, Generation Y, the millennial having family, uh, one of their biggest concerns is is now not reaching their full potential. And of course, uh, perhaps that is linking now to the fact that uh, that they are starting a family. And sometimes when you start a family, you have to give up uh, certain things in, uh, in lieu of, um, you know, looking after the little ones. So interesting things coming through the system. Uh, in fact, when you analyze the top fear of basically generation Y, it is also not having enough money. And unbelievably, even though those new young workers to the system, Gen Z, uh, that were born between 1995 and 2009, their top concern, they won't have enough money. And uh, also equally Another concern for them is over 50% of them or around 50% of them believe they won't ever own a home. They'll be renters for life. So pretty crazy. As you can see, there's a bit of a spiral where the boomer isn't really concerned about not even having a property, but they're concerned about running out of money. The Gen X is definitely concerned about running out of money. Gen Y concerned about running out of money and not reaching their full potential. And believe it or not, the new workers to the system are very concerned about not being able to ever own a home. And of course, Gen Alpha is a generation which is suggested to end up being one of the biggest generations to ever live. Uh, If we think about uh, the the growth spurt, which um, is due to unfold we've got a new generation unfolding into the system and uh, they'll be in the millions but uh, australia of course is a country that loves the idea of migration Um, we're going to see some talented new australians grow and of course uh, when it comes to increasing your population It's really three factors, births, deaths, and migration. And of course, today, Australia is around 26.5 million. We're well on our way to 30 million. And uh, we'll be closer to 40 million people by mid-century. So we have a massive population coming into the country and, of course, our own births and deaths. And population brings a demographic conversation. Obviously, demographics is kind of the baby of population, how people choose to spend their money, where people choose to go, how people choose to identify themselves. It's a demographics conversation. And of course, uh, culturally, we have 
a lot of people coming in from many countries across the world. We are attracting skilled migrants from places like the Philippines, Vietnam, South Africa. Uh, our largest cultural co cohort comes from India and then from China. And so Australia is very much a fusion today and Anglo, Indian, Asian uh, uh, fusion. And um, when you sort of walk the streets, you will you obviously see how multicultural Australia tends to be. And of course, we run a skilled migration policy of, uh, you know, as much skill as you can bring into the economy, nurses, accountants, chefs, uh, engineers, um, you know, tax professionals. Like, these are all people where skilled migration program is targeting basically uh, more white collar workers coming into our economy. In some respects, I would argue that right now we need some unskilled people coming into the economy, not just more skilled people. I think, uh, you know, there is a lot of dirty jobs out there that um, some muscle could, uh, could, uh, could be used. And, um, you know, I'm, I, I'm, a, I'm a believer in, you know, we can't just create white collar jobs. Um, there needs to be other jobs as well. And, uh, and certainly I think, you know, we could open our doors to, to some, some, uh, you know, lower paying sort of jobs, so to speak, so that, um, you know, some, some, uh, some inflation could come out of the, the system. But as we know, when, uh, property, uh, is influenced by people, particularly a population increase. There is generally a correlation of economic output and, of course, a correlation of properties improving in price. And as a population increases, there is actually uh, data to show that naturally properties also increase. When your population increases by 1%, you're generally getting a growth rate of anywhere to three to four percent off the back of that. Uh, it could be spread out, it could be refrained growth, or it could be instant growth. But generally, what happens is one percent population growth equals around four percent property improvement in price, four percent value. So demographics is a baby of population. It is basically not necessarily a idea around, um, you know, just just the the nuance of population coming. Then everyone's a winner. Where when you think about demographics, you're really drilling into the different preferences a demographics has, different income levels, different types of housing that people want. It's not a, I guess, macro conversation. It's far more a micro conversation. And of course, it's a big, big part of my Forex growth plan. What motivates people, what motivates their behaviors, what motivates their lifestyle, what motivates their beliefs, what motivates their values. And if we as business owners, being property investor business owners, know what our customers want, then we as business owners can make better decisions on what type of product we're going to offer the marketplace. Remember, your job as a property investor is to choose a product. You're in the product business. The product, of course, is a property. It's four walls and a roof. It's some land. It's uh, a set of stairs. It's a bedroom. It's a backyard. It's a rooftop garden. It's a, an apartment building. You're in the product business. Products, obviously, connect to people. And so this is where if we start to understand demographics a little bit better, 
We can connect the right product to the right people. And if done really, really well, we can see a correlating capital growth rate off the back of that. Now, I love living in Sydney because I often think Sydney is the leading marketplace when it comes to the study of people. There is a lot of different people in Sydney. It's very multicultural. And of course, its real estate market is... 10, 15 years ahead in price. Uh, It's really one to two cycles ahead of every other marketplace when it comes to its price metrics. And uh, it's really just how Australia was settled. Sydney was really the first choice of settlement and it grew the fastest. It sprawled the fastest. It ran out of land the fastest. Um, It invited different nationalities to its ecosystem the fastest. And so you get this very good viewpoint, this very good voyeur point by living in Sydney and using what works in Sydney and taking it out of Sydney to apply elsewhere. And so, you know, I'm just a massive, massive, uh, I guess, Voya, when it comes to the idea of demographics, that, okay, that suburb does this, that's very similar to another suburb I know in another city. Could that other suburb in another city actually do what its cousin has done in Sydney, its cousin suburb? And so uh, when we think about what that is, it is known as the Paddington effect. Now, the Paddington effect is a real estate economic principle whereby a phenomenon is observed from various cities around the world, whereby a neighborhood is or a suburb is named Paddington. Uh, There tends to be an associated set of common characteristics. And so, what fundamentally the Paddington effect suggests is that you can learn a location in a more uh, more affluent Paddington and uh, take what that Paddington effect has unfolded in that city and go and apply the same rationale and get the same result elsewhere by buying a property in a different Paddington. I don't know if I just explained that very well. I don't feel like that came out at all well. I was very tongue-tied. There's too many Paddingtons. But effectively, what uh, the Paddington effect says is, okay, study Sydney's Paddington. Can you find another Paddington in Australia? Because it should effectively mirror what Sydney Paddington's gone on to do. And of course, if you know Sydney's Paddington, it's an expensive place. It is an amazing place. It's got one of the most highest square meter rates in Australia per square meter. They're beautiful little architecturally stunning uh, place. And uh, so if we were to look at Australia's Paddingtons, we've got one in Brisbane and we've got one in Sydney. Now, If you were to look at Brisbane's Paddington and you would look at the location, it's basically a few kilometres from the city. Uh, It's known for its charming tree-lined streets and Queenslander kind of housing. If you look at Paddington, it's a couple of of, uh, suburbs away from the city. Um, It's relatively close to the city and it's got this kind of also charming tree-lined vibe. If you were to look at the housing in Paddington, it's traditional, architecturally pleasing Queenslanders uh, from basically uh, early settlement. If you were to look at Paddington, Sydney, it's Victorian terraces from early Sydney. It's really both suburbs carry a distinctive architectural style when it comes to their housing. If you were to look at Paddington, Brisbane, 
uh, and you were to look at the culture and lifestyle, it's very vibrant. It's boutique shops, cafes, art galleries. If you were to look at Paddington, Sydney, it's very vibrant. It's boutique, shopping, uh, trendy dining and, uh, you know, art galleries. And so both suburbs are very sort of upscale and in line with each other, the Paddington effect. If you were to look at the personas, the demographics inside of both areas, young professionals, you know, well, well-trodden well families, um, and uh, generally, you know, you're getting this higher income um creative type in both suburbs if you really drill into the personas they're creative they're artistic uh, in both neighborhoods and uh, if you were to look at the amenity of both neighborhoods both have great green space nearby Paddington Brisbane is surrounded by lush parks and greenery and Paddington, Sydney is surrounded by really Centennial Park, which is, again, this green space offering. Now, the point of the conversation of the Paddington effect is that what we're studying there is really the location, the housing, the culture, and the persona. The people really, I guess are a big part of really how the Paddington effect works. And so when we consider the Paddington mirror, it's really housing similarities, cultural similarities, persona similarities, uh, amenity similarities, and location similarities. And of course, the co- the argument then is, well, if we're going to study demographics and we can simplify that using the Paddington effect. Can we actually use the Paddington effect to make money out of real estate and just simply, uh, you know, choose a like for like and get an ultimate result? Well, I certainly think you can, but I will teach you there are some, I guess, snakes and ladders that you're going to go through to get the result. And even if we were to study Paddington, Brisbane, and compare it to Paddington, Sydney. Both areas are, you know, highly popular and will continue to get fabulous capital growth rates. But, uh, uh, you know, there's certainly no catch up from Brisbane, Paddington to Sydney's Paddington at this point. And there's no, nothing wrong with that. It's just simply the two marketplaces continue to grow in their own right, in their own character, in their own economy. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So I guess the question is, can you use your knowledge of demographics to take uh, the Paddington effect and successfully apply it from one city to another city? And uh, I think you can. I've certainly used this model. I recently studied Surrey Hills, Sydney, an area which was basically created by Mark Foy. Mark Foy was effectively a retailer. Mark Foy started um, some factories in Surrey Hills. Um, if you're not familiar with Mark Foy, he used it, it used to be a department store which had its own uh, which had its own manufacturing and production. And uh, you know today, We've only really got David Jones left uh, here in Australia, uh, but prior to that, we we had many uh, different stores, and one of them was Mark Foy's. Now, Surrey Hills even has a building named after Mark Foy. In Collingwood, the Foy and Gibson region was also owned by Mark Foy. Mark Foy basically had old... Uh, warehouses and uh, I guess manufacturing houses in both Surrey Hills and Collingwood. Collingwood is a couple of kilometres to the city of Melbourne. Surrey Hills is a couple of kilometres to the city of Sydney. And when I look at the two side by side, I can see the correlation of the Paddington effect. 
if I look at the demographics of Surrey Hills, it's really exclusive professionals, wealthy seniors, and really culturally cool uh, livers. And if I look at Collingwood, same concept. You've got exclusive professionals, wealthy kind of seniors, and the culturally cool people inside of society with enough income uh, to to live that urbanist lifestyle. And when I look at both suburbs, I can see that both areas are all about renewal and, and just constantly making their suburbs better. And so I can see a correlation of the Paddington effect. And for me, uh, why I chose to invest in Collingwood was because I would love to own real estate in Surrey Hills. I can't afford to own real estate in Surrey Hills, so I used the Paddington effect to uh, effectively choose a version of Surrey Hills in another area. So you can have two cities, two suburbs, and really one persona. And uh, again, that's that's really a formula of demographics when it comes to buying real estate, using demographics to buy real estate. And uh, just have a little bit of water, a little bit of uh, dry mouth. But of course, it's not as linear as I'm explaining it. And I just want to give you some, I guess, comprehension around how demographics can work and how the Paddington effect can be disrupted. The first disruptor is going to be timing. Uh, The same sort of trends that you get in a suburb can be very different because of timing. Uh, For example, when uh, Surrey Hills became very popular, millennials weren't in their family formation stage. Today, They're in their family formation stage. So again, you've got this kind of demographic sliding doors when it comes to timing. Obviously, as well, there are a lot of local factors that differential the two concepts of the Paddington effect. Uh, Each city has its own unique conditions, job market, housing supply, um, regulatory environment, and of course, cultural concepts. So again, you've got to really be concise if you're trying to marry up this logic of the Paddington effect. And of course, every city has external factors, you know, crazy governments. Uh, You know, obviously in in Melbourne, there's been, um, you know, whether you've loved him or or despised him, you know, King Dan, and of course, uh, the Mad King is is no longer. But you know, different economic factors will will obviously, uh, p- p- you know, push and pull any sort of Paddington effect when it comes to this logic. And of course, when it comes to the idea that uh, there are. Uh, policies and regulations inside of real estate, you can u- often use this to see results, uh, particularly when it comes to the first homeowner market. And we've seen many, many good results by looking at, for example, new uh, stimulus or policies and regulations coming into the real estate market around tax incentives, stamp duty concessions, Uh, building boosts and you can see okay well that worked in Sydney Uh, that should work elsewhere using this kind of Paddington effect so in reverse you can get almost like um, a a positive result from understanding these things obviously if you're going to marry up a property using the Paddington effect you've got to really marry up culture and lifestyle preferences um, places can be the same distance from the CBD in different cities but culturally be worlds apart now I often see property investors uh, I guess come up with the theory of well that's 10 k's from the city 
uh, you know, in Sydney, 10 Ks from the city, you know, it's a, it's $2 million. Uh, well, we need to dig a little bit deeper to justify that statement to actually quantify that that will marry up. And again, the Paddington effect is really about marrying things up using location as one tool, but really housing similarities. Are the houses the same? Is the culture and lifestyle preference the same? And are the people the same? Which is a very, very important part of this puzzle. And again, like you can go to certain suburbs and completely different market segment. Like you're not marrying up the Paddington effect whatsoever. Uh, different family sizes, different household comp- comp- composition, uh, different generations in those suburbs, different income levels, different migration patterns, uh, different housing preferences. And so the point of the conversation is if we get good at demographics, we can definitely use the Paddington effect. If we're just uh, making some quick assumptions, we're not necessarily doing the Paddington move. Uh, and I see this, you know, as I say, I see it all the time. You know, oh, that's 10 Ks from the city. In Sydney, that would be $3 million. Uh, so one day it's going to be $3 million. Well, is it? Is it actually lined up like that? Is it actually a like for like? Uh, and this is where we use demographics. Demographics alongside some local factors which influence how things work. So when we think about connecting our real estate, which I'm trying to explain through the Paddington effect to people, it's a very important concept. And there are personas, personas in Australia. There are seven major cons- uh, personas. They are leading lifestyles. These are high income families, typically own their own home in inner or middle suburbs. They are leading lifestyles. And when we think about these people, they uh, are all about blue chip stocks, smart money. They're, you know, self-made lifestyles. They'll, 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 they're here for living. Status matters to them. Financial freedom matters to them. They are typically worldly. They're quite wise. They are even humanitarians. Uh, they are progressive thinkers and savvy self-starters. And really, the leading lifestyler is aiming to be set for life. And so this is one persona inside of our economy. The second persona is the Metrotech, well-educated, high incomes, uh, they can be young singles, they love the inner city, um, they love professional jobs, um, they can be uh, all about technology, they can be all about healthy, wealthy and being wise, they can be uber cool, uh, they love being fit and fabulous, they're social high flyers, they, they fundamentally... Uh, want to Instagram their life. They want to be seen. They want to show everyone what they're doing all the time. And really, you know, culturally, they can be even pioneers. And again, when I'm uh, trying to mirror up, if I'm trying to use the Paddington effect to buy real estate, I'm trying to understand, well, who are these people? Are they actually motivated to make money by living in a suburb? Uh if, if that's the case, I want a piece of that suburb. If they're not motivated, they're not motivated people. If their demographic persona is, is not uh, what I'm looking for, I'm going to steer clear. The next uh, group, if you like, is, uh, is today's families, young families uh, in, in those middle, outer middle suburbs, full-time workers earning above average incomes, and again, they can be very successful immigrants. They can be on their way up um, from, you know, their second or third or fourth generation or fifth generation Australians looking good, love their kids, hard workers, making a difference. Um, again, 
that's that's a that's a persona out in the marketplace. The fourth persona, Aussie achievers, uh, young, educated, living in um, middle to outer suburbs, working full time, uh, pay off their expenses on time, and uh, you know looking to achieve. They want to buy their home, or they've just bought their first home, and they're doing good. Then you've got obviously the other side of the equation and and I often talk about this as an economic divide you know the have and have nots well then you've you've kind of got the have nots which quite often are characterized by personas of getting by young parents or older families with children at home uh, they're in outer suburbs and they spend their time bargain hunting they 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 have to be very thrifty because they they don't have a lot to go around. So they've got to, you know, look at the prices in the supermarket. They've got to budget to make sure they're keeping up with their costs. And costs are probably something that drags them down. They don't necessarily make enough to pay for their costs. So Challenge and of course uh, the next co- cohort is uh, again uh, people in their golden years and and this cohort can be basically people who are well placed and people who are fundamentally battling pensioners. And the final cohort is just that those battlers. They are families, young couples, um, broken uh, families, which are, are just struggling to keep up with society's costs. And, um, you know, they can be uh, struggling to pay the rent, basically, which is which is a real thing. And of course, in real estate, I'm a big believer of teaching the 40-30 rule, 40% of society is fundamentally falling behind. 60% of society is doing uh, or keeping up. And so even when you examine how sh- how supermarket economics works, we see this all the time, right? You could go to a persona of leading lifestylers and see how they shop and how supermarkets price food in leading lifestyle locations. They will sell the higher cut of meat in leading lifestyle locations. Uh, The Wagyu they can sell for $50. It'll go to those supermarkets, the IGA, the Coles, the Woolworths, uh, will just have completely different basically food than if you were to go to the same supermarket brand um, where, you know, you'll see far more sort of thrifty, basic need kind of offerings in those marketplaces. And even sometimes you'll see the leading lifestylers get totally ripped off compared to what a getting by supermarket will price things at. The two-tiered pricing structure based around personas of demographics. Now, I can learn a lot from that because, again, if we're a business, we're in the business of having a product, we want to sell that product to people, we're simply a property owner, the property is the product, the people is both the tenant and, of course, the resale market, then we can learn if we're in a basic needs marketplace, Uh, if we're going to get someone coming along to pay more for that property down the track, double the price of what we've paid for the property, that might be a problem if that area is not gentrified by uh, perhaps a new cohort coming into that marketplace. So uh, we could in fact, buy in a demographic society where everyone's getting by, but all of a sudden uh, young families, aspirational young families, metro techs and leading lifestyles love the suburb and come and gentrify it. We're going to need their money for the real estate 
to double in value. We're going to need them to come into the neighborhood and pay more for real estate because they've got that disposable income. And again, uh, this is this is the science of it all. Some suburbs will gentrify, and uh, some of the reasons they will is they're just in great locations. They're really culturally amazing. They've got all the box ticked when it comes to amenity, improved personas, culture and lifestyle, good housing options, and location. They're really some of the principles that drive gentrification. So again, uh, personas are basically the idea of drilling into Gen Y, Gen X, Baby Boomer. Who are these people? What do they buy? What, how do they shop? What do they spend their time doing? And again, we can learn a lot from the idea that, okay, there is this concept called the Paddington Effect if we drill into, is this really the Paddington effect, we can get a result. Brisbane's Paddington performs very nicely, as does Sydney's Paddington. If we can drill into the same stuff, it is possible to go, there are two cities, two suburbs, but one persona that uh, is connected. And uh, we can use the alpha city like Sydney to get the result later in a secondary city such as Brisbane. So personas uh, almost create, uh, I guess, cohorts or sub-personas. And, and if you were to look at leading lifestylers, there is sort of cohorts, blue chip, smart money, self-made, status matters. These are all the buzzwords. And, uh, you know, I just simply try and break it down using Gopnik economics because I would like to explain, you know, how things really are out there in the w real world. So I use some language around how demographic struggle street works and demographic smart street works. And again, this is just pulling that data from... Gen Y, Millennial, then the Personas, and then going, okay, well, according to the Australian government, 40% of Australians spend over 30% of their income on housing and can't keep up with the cost of living. When I look at the seven Personas, three of the seven Personas are not keeping up. So it's quite accurate. So if I was to break down how the personas as cohorts linked to real estate, I would then, from a de demographic point of view, create some labels, and labels are never nice, but these are the types of people in society that are out there. The first one is the disadvantaged fringe battler. They typically are living in never to be gentrified housing. They either own it as someone paying off a debt and are or renting it. They are broken dwellings, the disadvantaged fringe. And again, I'm not such a big investor personally in the disadvantaged fringe. I've heard many people talk about the, uh, I guess, affordability but I don't think it's affordability is the right word, probably cheap ability of that area uh, as a great investment um, concept. Go into basically a broken neighborhood and hope for the best. I've never seen any evidence that that works out, um, but hey, I'm happy to be proven wrong. So the first demographic on Struggle Street is the disadvantaged fringe battler. I wouldn't be trying to use the Paddington effect going, oh, I've, I've bought in a disadvantaged friend battling suburb in Sydney. I'm going to go and do that in Perth. I don't know if that's a good idea. Uh, I, I, and, and for the reasons, again, different economies, different, don't know. The next demographic on Struggle Street 
is multicultural first generation renting basically with the diaspora and basically holding on. So obviously we get new immigrants coming to Australia. Uh, they tend to instantly go where their culture is, the diaspora. What did I say before? Dyspora. Diaspora is, and uh, they rent and they hold on and uh, they go to thousands of job interviews and they struggle to get a, get um, their full income or their worth or their value because they don't really have a proven history of uh, integration at this point in society. And again, like this is where you'll often see, you know, and I'm not sort of trying to judge here, I'm just explaining it, you know, a first generation person, they might be an engineer and they're driving an Uber uh, and they're basically renting, holding on. Uh, again, uh, s- starting out on Struggle Street. And, uh, you know, this is this is the type of renter that, again, you, you go, do you want real estate connected to that section of the market? I don't know. Doesn't really rock my boat. May rock your boat. Not sure. Then you got battling urban. Working adults who can only pay student rent. We see this all the time. Like there are people in society who basically uh, can't comprehend that the cost of living goes up and they can't comprehend that they should be paying more rent than they did 20 years before as a student. Uh, And so they battle. They typically are living in those urban areas, quite often even close to the city. And again, if you're going to buy real estate close to the city, generally the battling urban person is is buying the the most bro- well renting the most broken real estate because they can't afford the better real estate, and uh, they're sharing and and uh, just battling, battling. This is demographic struggle street. Then you've got uh, stressed seniors on the pension, uh, and they tend to be under a lot of rental stress. Probably one thing I learned as a property investor, I bought a property, a very, very inexpensive property in a, in a small town in New South Wales. Um, the town was actually Casino. Casino. I bought a property there. Look, it only cost me like 100 grand. Uh, and my tenant was a pensioner. And uh, when I bought it, I was more enthusiastic about spending a hundred grand. This was ages ago. I was like, wow, this is great. Uh, you know, a hundred thousand dollars. I've got, uh, I think I was getting $175 a week in rent. And then what happened was all the other properties nearby started to get rent increases. And I had this pensioner living there and, um, she would basically kick and scream every time I tried to raise the rent. You know, $5 was a lot of money. In the end, I just went, wow, this is this is just, this is Gopnik real estate. I'm getting out of this stuff. This is not going to make me wealthy. This is just uh, fool's gold when it comes to real estate. Buying a cheap property, having a pension to live there, the rental stress for the stress senior on the pension is 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 not going to make you wealthy having them connected to your real estate. So I bailed, sold up, uh, took off, and uh, never looked back. To be honest with you, at that model of real estate. So again, the rental stressed senior, they're probably renting, you know, a little villa. Uh, which is a bit run down and I'm describing the property I bought, a little bit run down and even they don't want you to renovate. Don't come and renovate. Don't add any value to the real estate because they obviously realize that the rent has to go up if you do that. So yeah, wouldn't recommend it. Uh, 
certainly I felt a bit sort of guilty as well, having these kind of economic conversations connected to, you know, a much older person. I've always uh, sort of grown up, respect your elders. And, uh, you know, I've, I kind of felt the whole system was, yeah, not aligned with that value. So I just bolted. But I wouldn't recommend it. Demographic struggle streak. There's a lot of people out there that, uh, you know, even if we were to look at the Generation X, 67% of Generation X, which is now getting older, uh, probably five, 10 years away from even reaching the pension now for much some of the older Xs. Uh, you know, you know, you've got to question yourself. You know, are these are these the people you want as long term tenants? They're going to end up in stress. Uh, and uh, the final sort of demographic struggle street is what I refer to using Gopnik economics. And I apologise if this offends everyone, but uh, you know, it's just a way of explaining it. Uh, the overeducated financial illiterate uh, they tend to overextend themselves on everything. Um, they've got great jobs. They don't how, know how to financially basically look after themselves despite earning hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. And they go into this sort of barely holding on uh, uh, vibe by living beyond their means, even though they've got great jobs. They don't ever surrender to basically maybe they need to, you know, go back to just go forward a little bit more and they'll be perfectly fine. And so there's plenty of people like this I meet that, you know, have had quality jobs. They've worked for Channel 9 for 20 years and they've made lots and lots of money, but they've got nothing in the bank to show for it. And uh, when you analyze why, you know, they've, they've lived a life which has, in some respects, been living beyond their means and again you'll see these people out in demographic struggle street so then uh, if we were to examine cohorts perhaps that are influencing success on the Australian real estate market uh, you've got demographic smart street and when I analyze demographic smart street you know for a start you can start with young having a go starting families that are growing growth is the key word and when i look at some of the successes in real estate it is happening in these first community building areas uh and often you know when we examine where first homeowners go they will go to new land corridors greenfield communities to start a family, and if we obviously link the millennial family movement right now, you know, for the next five, seven years, there's going to be some big growth in effectively uh, housing, particularly connect connected to young people having a go and starting growing families. And uh, without question, it's seen capital growth over the last five years, and I think it'll see some more capital growth over the next five years. And again, not every land corridor is good. Some are terrible, that is for sure, but certainly some of those beautiful communities that are growing are, are doing really, really well from a capital growth perspective. And we can see the demographic is, again, uh, you know, young families having a good crack at it. They're getting out there. They're, they're not suffering mortgage stress. They are willing to fight for what they have. And they will get through the current economic uh, interest rate cycle. Uh, they will have beans and rice. And uh, they will see though their real estate perform. Demographic smart street. The next demographic smart street cohort is the wealthy senior. Now, they're out there, as we realize right now, 45% of uh, baby boomers are not concerned about their economic future. There's a lot of money tied up in that 45% that are not concerned about their economic future. 
In fact, if we even look at the first homeowner market, the young families having a go, a lot of them that are successful are actually getting money out of their wealthy uh, parents that are baby boomers. And, um, you know, there's some articles, you could easily Google some articles pertaining to exactly that, that they are getting backed up by some serious cash. So it's interesting. It's, uh, it's happening right now. Grandparents are helping their grandchildren. Parents are helping their children get into a healthy property world. And again, you can use good examples of first homeowner communities in Sydney. Uh, if you can mirror them in Brisbane or Perth or Melbourne or Adelaide, you can take the Paddington effect but you've got to really drill into who these people are, the demographics. Are they similar people? This is what I'm trying to allude to. It may just be a house and land community with uh, not similar people. So will you get the same effect? You have to question yourself. That could be in the outer suburbs, the middle suburbs, the inner suburbs. It all has to do with demographics. So young people having a go, starting growing families, first cohort, second cohort, wealthy seniors, third cohort, aspirational new immigrants that become first home buyers. And again, uh, what I love about Australia is you've always got new people arriving and many of them are absolutely hungry to get onto the property ladder. And I see absolutely some mayhem uh, that unfolds from new aspirational immigrants. They go for it, man. Like they um, probably realise just how golden the opportunities are here in Australia and don't come with any limiting beliefs. And again, many of them will uh, jump into your more, more first homeowner areas and drive property success. Very different to uh, first generation multicultural renting and holding on. You kind of, no different to people who are second, third, fourth generation. You get a split as new people arrive. Some become very aspirational. Some uh, barely hold on. It's really the two worlds. The next demographic cohort is mature, stable families. And these, these tend to be in those middle suburbs, um, wealthier suburbs even. They're stable. Uh, they've been around for a long time. There's intergenerational wealth. And, uh, you know, there's a lot behind the uh, the stability of of those families and you often see them owning suburban homes there's a lot of wealth in there in 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 how they've developed over time now i often often see mature stable families as as quite often uh you know very lucky that their parents their parents before them their parents before them have all had this kind of stability that has helped grow uh, almost family intergenerational wealth. And so it's interesting, right? You get this kind of cohort. They know what they are. They've been around the block. Uh, they're, they're, they're old generation money, um, very mature, very stable. And, you know, if I was to explain, you know, my family tree, um, you know, it, it goes back five generations. And, uh, you know, I would consider myself part of that mature, stable family, intergenerational wealth world. Um, you know, if I look at my mum's side, Amadeo, he arrived from Italy, in Tuscany, Italy, Luca, in uh, 1860. Uh, he went to the gold fields in Perth. He had a son, which he also called Amadeo. Uh, Amadeo's son, which changed his name to Thomas. Thomas had Lily. Uh, Lily had Anne. Anne had Kay. And Kay had me. 
And so you can see there's a, a quite a long lineage here in Australia where you've got uh, a transition of wealth unfolding, even at a little bit, and you get this more mature, stable kind of uh, cohort, which I would describe myself as uh, a, a uh, person who has has uh, evolved in such a way. And it's not to say I'm better or anything, I'm just saying that's that's the reality of a difference between almost like an aspirational new immigrant to the opposite to that intergenerational transformation unfolding. And uh, you get that. Uh, affluent loner livers, more than uh, enough income to pay the rent, uh, to own their own apartment, and you you see see this affluent loner livers, a demographic smart street, and uh, if I look at some of the properties I own, they're rented to affluent loner livers, people on hundreds of thousands of dollars that just want to live by themselves, and the pleasure they get from not sharing, uh, from renting, um, you know, they they they're very very capable. They're even capable of buying, but they're choosing to live a better lifestyle. They are owners of real estate. They just don't want to live where they own their real estate. Affluent loner livers. Probably one of the most wealthy cohort is exclusive professionals. They tend to live in wealthy suburban homes, urban apartments, or even lifestyle apartments or lifestyle homes in lifestyle areas. And so, again... Demographic Smart Street. If you can own real estate next to mature, stable families, affluent loner livers, exclusive professionals, wealthy seniors, those downsizers with monies, aspirational new immigrants, young uh, people having a go, growing beautiful communities, uh, you're going to make money. And of course, the final demographic is that suburban mainstream upper middle class marketplace. They typically love houses. Uh, they're in those middle suburban rings. And, that, and uh, you know, from a capital growth perspective, these areas have always done really, really well. So what you got to do to play the Paddington game is you've got to find a suburb. You've got to marry the suburb up to another suburb but you've also got to marry the personas up. Uh, do the personas actually match? And again, um, suburbs have life cycles and, uh, you know, you've got different people coming in and out of suburbs at different times and to uh, work on Paddington economics, you've got to marry it up. So what a lot of investors choose is actually the wrong combo. And, uh, you know, I've tried to allude to trying to get this combo right. It's a little bit, would be easier on a PowerPoint slide if I could show you it. But, uh, hey, we're podcasters here. But what a lot of investors do is choose a bad combo, basically a suburb which is not actually mirroring the Paddington effect. It's the wrong suburb. Uh, it doesn't have the right cohort of people, doesn't have the right personas, it doesn't have the right uh, demographic generationally, it's not full of millennials, it's full of Gen Xs, uh, etc. It doesn't have the right uh, supermarket economics, you're not dealing with leading lifestylers, you're dealing with Aussie achievers. What happens is it's not all lined up. And of course, you get this misalignment of your expectation. And of course, uh, there isn't, though the location might be a similar distance, the location is completely different. While, uh, you know, a house is a house, the actual architecture style might be completely different. While, um, cultural lifestyle might appear the same, it might be completely different. While the people are people in a suburb, they may, may actually be completely different, earning different money, doing different things, having different habits, uh, believing in different beliefs. And so again, like when it comes to this concept, it's a great concept to use, but you've got to use demographics to dig into it. 
And uh, what I often think when it comes to how people approach it is they approach it wrong. And uh, I hear a lot of people go, well, cheap is the answer to success in real estate. So they'll go to a suburb in decline and choose a disadvantaged fringe battler as a persona and, uh, you know, hope that that works out. Um, And again, if we were to look at who's in mortgage stress at the moment, it's uh, it, it's it's the battlers. It's the persona of the battler. And I always say this in real estate: the easiest way to pitch a real estate is the monopoly board. You have four sides to the monopoly board, and I assume everyone would have played. If you haven't, you need to. You've got where the best real estate is: the green and the dark blue. That's the discretionary end of the marketplace. The yellows and the reds. That's the affluent section. The purples and the orange, that's the affordable section. And then uh, the sky blue, and I think it is uh, brown, that's the disadvantaged section or the disinvested section. And so what we're trying to do with the Paddington effect is use the principle that there's two monopoly boards, two cities. Can we actually get a result in the affordable section, the affluent section, or the discretionary section of the market using uh, the idea that young families can make us money because they're having a go in great communities. Wealthy seniors can make us money because they're lifestyle seekers. Aspirational new immigrants can make us money because they will choose a cultural section of society to invest in. Uh, By way of example, aspirational new uh, Indian migrants tend to love housing communities. If we can cotton on to where their housing community preference is, it's going to make money. Mature, stable families uh, in wealthier suburban areas tend to make us money. Affluent loner livers that have more income and less expenses tend to make us money in those inner urban areas. Exclusive professionals in wealthy suburban homes, urban apartments, or those lifestyle apartments tend to make us money. These are our neighbors. These are the neighbors of our property as an investment. And of course, that suburban mainstream, uh, better than middle class marketplace, they tend to make us money. That's what we want. We want to invest where these people are. We don't want battling urban. We don't want broken, disadvantaged battlers. We don't want stressed seniors and pensioners. And we, uh, you know, uh, we will buy in real estate where there is a mixture of everyone in every suburb. But really, what smart demographics is, is the top three cohorts make up over 50% of the suburb. Now, everyone I've listed from the disadvantaged to first-generation multicultural battler to battling urban, stressed pensioner, wealthy senior, aspirational new immigrant, mature families, they could be in every suburb, but what we're looking for is the majority of the suburb is really the top three of those groups groupings, if you like, and that's what we're looking for. And we're going to marry that up with a suburb to buy in. And of course, that will allow us to create property success. So hopefully that all made sense. I have a sneaky feeling it may not have. We never know until we get to the end if the property podcast is going to be a success. But hopefully today you've learned about how the Forex growth plan works when it comes to demographics, the different demographic generations and what their biggest fears are, the types of personas in the real estate marketplace, and of course, the Paddington effect. That was the mission. Did we succeed? I don't know. Feel free to leave a review. Thanks, folks. I'll catch you on the next episode as we talk more real estate. Thanks for tuning in to the Urban Property Investor. To never miss an episode, make sure you subscribe to the podcast on your favorite app or on YouTube. And I would love it if you could give the show a rating and share it with your friends and family. In between episodes, you can always keep in touch with me 
by connecting on social media over Facebook, Instagram, or LinkedIn. Until we meet again on the next episode of the Urban Property Investor, take care and bye for now.